start this recording. Okay. So recorded, recorded. Oh. Last day we finished our very first type of inference question, which was so for review. Well, we're not going to do any review. Um, but we finished. And I'm going to be talking a lot about question types because it's really uh, the best way to kind of guide you through reading questions, identifying what you need to do, which is really hard. Uh, and it kind of guides you in the right direction. So we only talked about one sample proportion, which on your formula sheet is here, right? So once you've read a question and you've figured out that you have a one sample proportion question, then you're limited to that area on your formula sheet, right? So that's nice. It's just hard to read a question and figure out what it is. So today what we're gonna do is, and we used one sample proportion to introduce uh, the rules of the road or the rules of the game, hypothesis testing, confidence intervals, and now we're gonna build that out to another type of question, which is two sample proportions. Uh oh, I want to copy. And let me add a page here. So today we're going to introduce two sample proportions. There are a couple of new concepts, but once you're kind of okay with those new concepts, then there's really nothing new that we need to introduce, which is really nice. Now, as the, the name of the section, which is section 6.2, uh, but also two sample proportions suggests is that now you have two samples, you've got proportions, from each of those and you want to compare those proportions. Usually we wanna know, are these two proportions significantly different from each other, right? Which means, is there a difference of zero or a difference significantly different from zero? And that's where the wording gets a little bit uh, boggy. Okay. The slides introduce it slower, but I do wanna, use the formula sheet to introduce all these concepts because the formula sheet is what you're going to have right on the test and so it's it's good to kind of get down into the nitty-gritty of the of what's given to you yeah. so once you've read a question and it sounds like you have two samples and you've got proportions from each sample and it might say something like is there a difference in the proportion of uh, females who watch hockey and males who watch hockey. I don't know, whatever, right? Uh, then we wanna talk about a difference in proportions, okay? And so of course, we're not interested in the sample differences of proportions. You can find that easily, right? You can just calculate it. What we really wanna know is what's the population difference in proportions? So we use little subscripts to denote which group P1 is coming from and P2 is coming from. Usually we try to use question specific subscripts, right? Uh, PM, PF, that kind of thing, right? But P1, P2 generically. So thinking back to one sample proportion, right? We were just interested in how P behaved, right? Now we've got P1, P2 is what we're interested in from the population. So what's our point estimate? Well, our best guess is gonna be the difference in P1 and P2 hat, right? So if you wanna build a confidence interval, it looks the same if you kind of put your, put your blinders on. You've got your point estimate, 
your best guess for what P1 and minus P2 is, is P1 hat minus P2 hat there. Z star is your critical value, right? So if you're building a confidence interval, you need to know something that dictates the confidence level, right? That's your Z star. So this, this is kind of a, a quick win, right? That's the critical level. And so here, this is the critical value which determines the width of your interval, right? And you know how to find that. Same thing, T table uh, is the shortcut way, right? It gives you the confidence levels up at the top and then you go down, ignore everything in the middle till you're at Z star and then you can find your Z star. This looks a little bit gross, right? But that's only because now you have two sample proportions to deal with instead of one, which means that you have a sample proportion from group one, P1 hat. You also have the opposite of it, Q1 hat. That's just one minus P1 hat. You've got a sample size one. And then you do the same thing for group two, P2 hat times Q2 hat, which is one minus P2 hat over N2. Notice that that's the same. It's just doing it for both samples instead of one, right? It was the square root of P hat, Q hat over N. That was nice and cute. Now we're doing that, but for two samples, right? Because we need to take into account both groups, right? So the extension, it just means more math. It's not hard, right? It's just more math. You have to be careful, okay? And so, <clears throat> This is the standard error for a confidence interval. So this is the standard error for P1 hat minus P2 hat for a confidence interval. Yeah. Just like before, when we had one sample proportion we had a slightly different standard error calculation, but it's on your formula sheet. So you don't even need to name it if you don't want to, right? You can just say, well, it changes if I'm doing a confidence interval or a hypothesis test. The reason I bring it up is because when we check our conditions, the conditions stay the same, right? And we, we talked a lot about conditions last day, the conditions for a confidence interval, if I have to do a confidence interval, well, I have to have randomly sampled uh, data. Otherwise, I can't assume independence, right? So that's our number one thing. And then I tend to skip the N less than 10% of the population condition because it's, what are you going to do? You've got too big of a sample, boo-hoo. Um, but the success failure condition, right? We went back and we said, well, what did I use in my standard error? I used P hat. Right. And so now for our confidence intervals for the difference in two proportions, now I'm going to use the number of successes in sample one has to be greater than or equal to 10. The number of failures in sample one has to be greater than or equal to 10. The number of successes in sample two has to be greater than or equal to 10. And the number of failures in sample two has to be greater than or equal to 10. So we just do it for both samples. It's more work, but we just do the same thing for both samples, okay? And so that P hat guides me to that condition, right, for the confidence interval. When I see P1 hat, P2 hat, that's what I'm gonna use to check my conditions. There's, I'm not gonna write that down here because it's way too much on here, but I will make a note that that's what I said. Uh, we use, fine, I will write it down, NP1 hat greater than or equal to 10, NQ1 hat greater than or equal to 10, N, oh, sorry, N1, N1, N2, P2 hat greater than or equal to 10, N2, Q2 hat greater than or equal to 10. Um, maybe I'll just say success failure. condition is that. Let that be my, my guide. Okay. 
And like I said, we're going to go through all of this slower, but I want to give you everything before we do, and then we'll, we'll kind of fill in the gaps again, okay? And so for hypothesis testing, again, I want to know about P1 minus P2. What's the difference between those two values? And for hypothesis test, our null hypothesis, it's just a matter of what you like, okay? And so you could say, okay, is there a difference between these two proportions? That's usually what we're interested in. So what we have to assume at first is that there's no difference, right? P1 is equal to P2. Okay. I can translate that to being P1 minus P2 is equal to zero. Right. The reason that we usually start off with this hypothesis is because it matches what we want to talk about. I like doing this. P1 is equal to P2 because it kind of uh, condenses it a little bit. And then I can, in my alternative hypothesis, I can say uh, P1 is less than P2, for example, or not equal to. And for me, it's easier to see the relationship. Whereas if you're talking about P1 minus P2, how it relates to zero, right? If P1 is greater than P2, then this would be greater than zero, right? So it's just a little bit more thinking, for me at least, when I want to talk about the relationship of P1 minus P2, how it relates to zero, okay? And so that's why I like this version. But there are kind of reasons we introduce both because we want to talk about P1 minus P2, right? If P1 minus P2 is equal to zero, then they're the same, right? Or no significant difference. Okay. What's the general formula for our test statistic? It was always a point estimate. No. I was on a roll. Remember, point estimate, point estimate, point estimate. Zad is the point estimate minus the null value. How far? Wait. Uh oh. I did not mean to do that. Ah. That's what I get for drawing on a thing I imported. Z is the point estimate minus the null value divided by the standard error of the point estimate. The point estimate, remember, is P1 hat minus P2 hat. That's my best guess at what P1 minus P2 looks like. Notice that I didn't write anything else. Why? Because technically here, I've got P1 hat minus P2 hat minus P1 minus P2, but we always assume the null hypothesis is true, so we always have zero here, right? You can have values other than zero, so then you would need to reintroduce it, but we're never going to have that scenario. It's extremely rare, okay? where you want to show that the proportion of group one is maybe 0.1 higher than 0.2 or a P2. Okay. So we don't even write this, this null value because it's always zero, right? And so here, right? Uh, P1 hat minus P2 hat minus zero. You don't need to write the zero. That's why it's not even on there because it would make it very crowded. Um, and then we've got this sneaky little guy here, this P hat. But Emily, I have two samples. What the hexagons? Where did P hat come from? Got P1 hat, P2 hat, got a P1, P2. What about, where is this P hat coming from? Well, 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 well. Where P hat is the pooled proportion estimate. Okay. And so P hat is the special value. 
where you have the combined number of successes. And there's all these kind of cute graphics where, uh, you know, all these proportions are being pushed into a pool. You're a success, everyone's a success. And, and you just push everyone into a pool and you count the number of successes. It doesn't matter what group you came from over the combined number of cases, right? You can think about it just in those terms. Mathematically, you could translate it to N1, P1 hat. That's gonna be the number of successes in group one plus N2, P2 hat. That's the number of successes in group two over N1 plus N2. Or if you have the successes, the raw successes, you could just use that X1 plus X2 over N1 over, uh, plus N2. So depending on what information you have, right, you could use one of those and they're all on there for a reason, right? Often it's nice if we have just this, this formula, the X's, then uh, it's a little bit easier. Yeah. So then I've got this added step of having to find my pooled proportion. But once I have the pooled proportion, then I have Q hat as well, right? One minus P hat, same as always. And one over N1, that's fine. Plus one over N2, that's fine. I say it's fine. It's mathematically fine, easy, uh, right? So once you have your pooled proportion, right, then you're off to the races. But what happens here? This is the standard error of the point estimate for a hypothesis test, which means what? In terms of checking our success failure condition, we're gonna use P hat, we're gonna use this, the pooled proportion. And it's just, they made up so many rules, but we can't go back because it was a very long time ago. The success failure condition you're gonna check is N1 times P hat greater than or equal to 10. N1 times Q hat is a greater than or equal to 10. N2 times P hat is a greater than or equal to 10. And N2 times, oops, Q hat greater than or equal to 10. You have to check both samples again, but you use that pooled proportion instead of the individual proportions. Yeah. Okay, which is sort of similar to the one sample case where we had to use the hypothesized proportion, right? We had to use P naught to check our hypothesis testing success failure condition. And so this is kind of down that same road because we don't have anything. If I multiply by zero, nothing, it doesn't give me anything. So I don't have a null value necessarily. Okay. So this is where I say, there you have it. Everything you could possibly need is on your formula sheet. How rude. Now let's take it way back with an example so we can see how this all plays out. So one of the main things that we want to talk about is identifying a two sample proportion question, right? Because once you have that, then you can build a confidence interval you can interpret a confidence interval because the interpretation is the same as before, right? You're just talking about the difference in the proportions, right? You can do a hypothesis test and all the steps are all the same, right? Except now you've got a, a slightly longer null hypothesis, alternative hypothesis, test statistic, you're still calculating a Z. Once you have a Z, the p-value is still there in the tail, and then you're, you're back in the same scenario, the exact same scenario that we've been in. So, oops. Our example oy, is this. So you don't have to answer, but melting ice caps. So scientists predict that global warming uh, may may have big effects on the polar regions within the next hundred years, safe to say. One of the possible effects is that the northern ice cap may completely melt 
would this bother you a great deal? Some, a little, or not at all, if it actually happened. And so there are the options. Now, the GSS, I meant to look up what the GSS, it's a survey, it's this huge survey that they run, and I can't remember what it's actually called, but um, anyways, general society survey, I don't know, something like that. The GSS asks the same question. And here are the distributions of responses from the 2010 GSS. So here's one sample from the GSS survey, as well as from a group of introductory statistics students at Duke University. Another sample, all right? And so here, I've got sample one and sample two. We've got proportions in each category. Now we're gonna we're gonna hone in on this first category. Who's concerned with or what proportion is concerned with it being a great deal? Um, right. So now we're gonna have four hundred and fifty four out of six eighty would answer a great deal in the GSS and 69 out of 105 at Duke University in an intro stats class, throw that in there, um, would answer a great deal, right? So now we have two sample proportions that we're interested in. So here, I'll write P GSS, he had GSS. Oh, that doesn't read very well, does it? Four hundred and fifty-four out of six eighty, and P hat Duke is sixty-nine out of one hundred and five. All right. Let's say that this is the. Uh, We'll call this a success. In section 6.4, something tells me we're going to have to kind of fly through it slash potentially uh, assign it as reading on your own, not to be tested type of thing. Uh, but what we do there is we look at all of the response categories. So then we have a two-way table and we can test for independence between those uh, groups. But for now, we're just gonna focus on two sample proportions. Okay. So we have a, a parameter of interest, which is the difference in proportions of all Duke students and all Americans who would be bothered a great deal. And that's where I got this, right? That's what we're calling a success. By the Northern ice cap completely melting. So what we're interested in hypothesizing about and inference about is the proportion of Duke students minus the proportion of the all U Americans US. Okay. So the GSS is representing all Americans and the this Duke sample, even though it's just from an intro stats class, we assume it's representative of all Duke students, right? That's one of the assumptions we're making. May or may not be true, but as long as you say it, that's what you're assuming. So then our point estimate is the difference between the proportions of sampled Duke students and sampled Americans, so that's from the GSS survey, who would be bothered a great deal by the northern ice cap completely melting. So you've got this P hat Duke and P hat US, which I call GSS, but maybe... I'll make a note here. Could call it GSS if you want, but 
but the GSS is representing all Americans. GSS represents all Americans. Or we assume it represents all Americans. <clears throat> So in terms of inference, right, confidence intervals, hypothesis testing, the umbrella term is inference. And like we said, on the formula sheet for a confidence interval, you're going to have some point estimate plus minus the margin of error. We've already seen what that looks like, right? Uh, but again, we're just going back through it nice and slow. For a hypothesis test, you're still going to calculate a Z, which you know how to find probabilities associated with Z. So that's really handy. You just need to know what the calculation is. Okay? And we're going to see that a lot where uh, some distribution can be applied to multiple different scenarios. Okay? So the Z distribution works for one sample proportions and two sample proportions, right? If we have more than two proportions that we want to compare, then we have to use a chi-squared. But that'll be our first new test statistic. So the point estimate minus the null value, which is always zero in our case, and then divided by the standard error, which we saw changes a little bit. Okay. So we just need to find the standard error. Okay. And so the standard error in general, right, in the population looks like this, P1 times one minus P1, which I, I write Q1 because I'm lazy, over N1, and then P2 times one minus P2, which is Q2 over N2. And depending on what we have, right, uh, if we have a confidence interval, then we use the hats, P1 hat, P2 hat. Yeah, let me write that down. So for a confidence interval, use P1 hat and P2 hat. And for a hypothesis test, use P hat, the pooled proportion. I guess I kind of breezed over it on the formula sheet, but let me go back there. Because it is on there, right? We only talked about this version of Z, but if we compare this version with the, the next version of Z, there's an equal sign here, then we've got the same thing in the numerator because that doesn't change. The only thing that's happened here is I've distributed the P hat, Q hat, right, so that you don't have brackets. But besides that, it's the same, right? Here I just multiply p hat q hat once instead of twice. And so for me, that's uh, an easier calculation than doing this twice, dividing by n1 and n2 and then adding them up. But whichever one you like, it's up to you. But notice how this is the same format as up here, right? Instead of P1 hat, Q1 hat, you have P hat, Q hat, P2 hat, Q2 hat, you have P hat, Q hat. So they're the same, just grabbing P's from different locations. And they're gonna be so similar anyways, which we'll see. Okay. But it's just a matter of being, being proper. The reason we use P hat is because it gets us a, a better estimate, right? We're always about improving our estimates. So in terms of our conditions, for a confidence interval, so this is for a confidence interval, independence within the group. So as soon as we introduce another group, so now I have two groups, whereas before we only had one sample and we had to assume that everything within that sample was independent of everything else, right? So we still have that, but for both groups, 
And so we have to have independence within groups, but we also have to have independence between the groups. So group one has to be independent of group two, right? And so usually how we argue that is we just say, I assume that this group is independent of this group, right? I assume that the sample Duke students and the sample uh, Americans in the GSS survey are independent of each other. I think that's fair, probably. <laughs> probably. Um, but usually the independence between groups is just something you argue, right? I, as I assume that these two groups are independent of each other. So the independence within groups, you have to talk about both groups. So the US group is sampled randomly. It didn't say because the GSS is a, a proper survey. So of course they're sampled randomly or we can assume that. And we're assuming that the Duke group represents a random sample as well. That's not really true. Why are we saying that? If I just sur surveyed everyone in the class and said, you all represent Okanagan College, it's not necessarily true, but true enough. Huh? And also I have to say that because otherwise I can't proceed with my analysis. So there's that, that's a problem, All right? So sometimes we just have to uh, push it through, even if it's not necessarily true. Okay. So this one, it's more a, a matter of you surrendering to it, probably being okay, right? Instead of arguing the opposite that no, they're not representative of all Duke students, so I can't go ahead. I mean, no, I can't give you marks for that. <laughs> There's nothing I can do. I can't proceed. Technically a sound argument, but no. Um, for some reason, N Duke, which was, I think, 105. 105 is less than 10% of Duke students, of all Duke students, and 680, which was the NGSS, is less than 10% of all Americans, right? That's the 10% condition, which I'm not too hung up on. Uh, but if you remember to throw it in there, that's great. But if not, it's okay. So because there, we can assume independence within each groups, right? We can assume that the attitudes of Duke students in the sample are independent of each other. And the attitudes of US residents in the sample are independent of each other as well. Right? That's the argument that we want to make. Right? Then we move on to the independence between groups. So the sample Duke students and the US residents are independent of each other. Right? Just an argument that you're going to make. And then for the confidence interval, the success failure, and maybe what we'll do is instead of highlighting this, we can make a generic and outline both because we've already introduced it, so why not? I'll add a page to do that though. I need lines, apply. Um, it's true, I shouldn't have used red, but for the success failure condition, which I, I wanna mention it again because there are some kind of old documents that I might share where I call it the normality condition not the success failure condition. I like success failure because it guides you in the right direction, but technically what you're arguing, is that the door? Just phantom, phantom door knocks. Uh, we're arguing normality, right? We're arguing that the central limit theorem applies for the difference in proportions because the success failure condition is met. 
Okay, so sometimes I call it the normality condition. And if you're doing a confidence interval, like I said, you're gonna check N1 times P1 hat greater than or equal to 10. You're gonna check N1 times Q1 hat greater than or equal to 10. Right, that's sample one. And you're gonna check N2, P2 hat greater than or equal to 10. And N2, Q2 hat greater than or equal to 10. That's for sample two. Less tedious, yes. Hard, no. Right? And so, or what could you do? X1 greater than or equal to 10 if you have X, right? If you have your number of successes versus N minus X1 or N1 minus X1 greater than or equal to 10 or x2 greater than or equal to 10, n2 minus x2 greater than or equal to 10, just depending on what information you have. So for checking the conditions, having your x's uh, is a lot nicer, I think. All right. But if you don't, no worries. n times p gets you there. For a hypothesis test, Use the pooled proportion. And that's why they only wanted to introduce the, the rules for the confidence interval here, because we haven't introduced the pooled proportion. But we have, as a group, which is the total number of successes, oops, successes, over the total samples, which is gonna be X1 plus X2 over N1 plus N2. Working backwards, right? If I don't have X2, I could use N2 times P2 hat. So, or, P hat is N1, P1 hat plus N2, P2 hat. That's the number of successes in group one, number of successes in group two over N1 plus N2. And that's on your formula sheet, right? It's not a matter of memorizing. It's a matter of remembering when you need to use it, right? So for a hypothesis test, you need to check that N1 times P hat is greater than or equal to 10. And there is no X associated with this. Uh, you just have to find P hat and use it. N1 times Q hat greater than or equal to 10. And N2 P hat greater than or equal to 10. And N2 Q hat greater than or equal to 10. The difference between these two things are that this, and maybe I'll use a different color. These are the expected successes and failures. Okay. So expected successes and failures whereas for a confidence interval, we're actually talking about the observed successes and failures. And we could have used the same terminology for the one sample proportion scenario as well, right? So here, this is the observed successes and failures. So for a confidence interval, you check that the observed successes and failures are greater than or equal to 10. And then for a hypothesis test, you check to make sure that the expected successes and failures under the null hypothesis are greater than or equal to 10. Just slight variation. 
Good. Get that out of the way. How do I move? Oh, I don't want to do that. I want to move this whole thing. There. Whoa. How about over here? Out of the way somewhere. Once we've checked those conditions, then we can make a 95% confidence interval, for example, right? And so if we reduce, I'll turn around, but that's okay. Uh, if we reduce our information to either carrying a, a great deal or not a great deal, that's everything else, right? We just zipped it up. There are other categories, but you can just reduce it to a binary situation, right? Success, failure. And right here, this is a success, whereas this is a failure. Notice that you have the observed successes and the observed failures already, right? And so in terms of doing a, a confidence interval, right, then I can just look. 69 is greater than or equal to 10, 454 is greater than or equal to 10, 36 is greater than 10, 226 is greater than 10. So all the conditions are met for a confidence interval. That's great. And like I said, they'll always be met. It's a matter of jumping through all the hoops. So now we want to construct a 95% confidence interval. Once we've identified, okay, what are my sample proportions, then it's really just a matter of plug and chug here. So P hat for Duke was 0.657, right? 69 over 105. Oh, question, sorry. Does it matter what you assign as P1 and P2? No, as long as you're consistent. And even then, it doesn't really matter. But what I mean is, as long as you have group you're not doing a mashup of group one group two up here no one would do that right but it doesn't matter what's going to change though is whether this is positive or negative but when you're interpreting the interval it doesn't matter right because if it's negative it means what it means the proportion of duke students was less than the us right if it's positive and we have these flipped it means the U.S. was higher than Duke. So just interpretation changes, but the interval stays the same. And the meaning stays the same. So we've got our sample proportions. We're building an interval around the difference in the sample proportions, which we have calculated up here. And then we're using Z star is 1.96 from the T table, right? 1.96 is kind of a go to one. But from the T table, if I want to make a 95% confidence interval, scroll all the way down to a Z star of 1.960. Oops. So that's where that came from. So that stays the same. How we find that Z star stays the same now. P hat Duke was 0.657, again, times Q hat Duke over N Duke, right? And so it's just a matter of plugging in the values and evaluating. So as long as you're, you're going nice and uh, methodically, right? multiply each of the numerators, divide by the denominator, maybe use the store function on your calculator, do the second one separately and then add them up. And then don't forget to take the square root, All right? It'll make a mess if you don't. Yeah. But once you've got the standard error calculated, you can multiply it by 1.96 and you find that the margin of error is 0.097. Yeah. So here, from negative 0.108 up to 0 0.086, what is that? If we have to interpret this, which we do. So let me add a page. And I'm surprised they didn't. The distribution landing over those two numbers. Yes. Yeah. 
the difference, well, the difference is that now you're talking about the difference in proportions. So let's grab, because what we're going to do is we're going to reword this question as an answer for our interpretation. So I'm just going to put it up there, put her there. Maybe not quotes, maybe I say we need to interpret the interval. That's our job, right? Our job isn't doing the math because uh, any software can do the math. The interpretation is our job, right? We have to do the math to get to the interval and then we can interpret it. It's all the all part of the skills, but we are 95% confident the interval from negative 0 0.108 to 0 0.086. Notice that that's the exact same setup. In fact, I'll follow it up with captures. Capture those. So that's the exact same setup that we had for interpreting a confidence interval for one sample proportion, right? Captures the population proportion of whatever we want it to do. Now, what are we capturing? We're trying to capture P1 minus P2, right? The population difference in proportions. And so captures and where I'm grabbing this from, the difference between the proportion of Duke students and Americans who would be bothered a great deal by the melting of the Northern ice cap. That's what I'm capturing. Yeah. And so I take that and I toss it in here. Captures the difference, and let me move this, oh, okay, that's confusing, there. Captures the difference between the proportions of Duke students and Americans Who would be bothered a great deal by the melting, tedious but not hard, of the northern ice cap? Hmm. Okay, so a difference of negative 0.108 up to a difference of 0 0.086. Okay. So what we're saying is that we're 95% confident that P Duke minus P US is somewhere between negative 0.108 and 0 0.086. I don't want you to take the interpretation any further, right? But I want to show you what it what it is. So in terms of on the test and on the final exam, this is all I want, right? You've made a confidence interval for the difference in the proportions. You don't have to go on and talk about what the difference in the proportions means, right? But if P Duke minus P US is negative 0.108, then that means that P Duke is 10.8% less than P US, right? And so here, what this means is that P Duke minus P US 
is negative one, oops, sorry, negative 0 0.108, which means P Duke is 10.8% less than US. I'll say P US in that scenario. Those buggers at Duke, they don't care. But what about on the other side? Then they care more, 8.6% more than US. What do we get out of that? Because this interval crosses zero, right? You're going from a negative to a positive. Then what does that mean in terms of the potential population difference? It could be zero which means that there is no difference. In fact, no significant difference in the population proportions. Whoa. P Duke, so now on the flip side, minus P US, if it's positive 0 0.086, then P Duke is 8.6% greater or higher than PUS, right? Since a difference, right? And what I mean is a difference in the proportions, since a difference of zero is in the interval, right? We can conclude there is no significant difference between the two proportions is in the interval, we can conclude there is no significant difference in the proportions. If I want you to do that follow-up, it would be an explicit part in the question, right? So, like I said, in terms of what I want you to be able to do on a test, right? You were done here, right? Captures the difference between uh, the difference uh, between the proportions of Duke students and Americans who would be bothered a great deal by the melting of the northern ice cap. Done. Step away from the plate, right? But what does that mean in terms of the, the actual interpretation is that because zero, a difference of zero is in this interval, I'm 95% confident that there's no difference between these two groups, no significant difference. Good. How about a true hypothesis test? Oh, all right. What if I want to do it properly, Emily? I know, I know, let's do it properly. <clears throat> On to hypothesis testing. Which of the following is the correct set of hypotheses for testing if the proportion of all Duke students who would be bothered a great deal by the melting of the Northern ice cap differs from the proportion of Americans who do? Now, notice that we're gonna be talking about the difference in proportions being different from zero. So words matter and they make a real mess, right? So here we're talking about the difference in proportions being different from zero. Right? There's two options, just like on your formula sheet, right? Depending on how you want to uh, approach it, you know your null hypothesis is gonna have an equal sign. So that's a good place to start. You know your hypotheses have to be about the population, right? Not P hats anywhere. And so right away, this one's so jarring, p hats, 
you know exactly what they look like and you know they're not the same right so right away who cares it's not about p hats and let's see here let's just make sure that all the other null hypotheses have an equal sign in them yes 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 okay fine right then we focus on the alternative hypotheses okay. P Duke is equal to, or not equal to P US. That sounds pretty good, but let's read on. P Duke minus P US is not equal to zero. Okay, yeah. They're the same, right? The only one that's different here is P Duke is equal to P US, and then P Duke is less than P US, which is something that we could test, but not what the question is asking, right? We want to know if there's a difference between these groups. This would be if, is there evidence that P Duke is less than P US or the proportion of Duke students is less than the proportion of all Americans, right? And so this one here is out, but these two, bing, bing, just depends on how you prefer to read it and write it. You only have to do one, obviously. So decide which one you like uh, and use that. I tend to gravitate towards this one because it's easier for me to read it. But this one is, is technically more helpful in the long run because you have this zero here that you can talk about. Question? Yes. So this is just, let's say this is a multiple choice question on a test. Well, I would never do that to you. Okay. Yeah. So there's two right answers, but that doesn't matter. Either or is right. Yeah, unless I can program it to, to accept either or, right? Then of course, either one is fine. Um, but no, on, on a written one, I wouldn't. This, yeah, so a hypothesis test is always going to be, uh, you know, a full long answer written one. So then in that case, you can write whichever way you like. I'll know what you mean, as long as you say it properly. I'll still know what you mean, even if you don't say it properly, but that's not the point. So both A and C are correct. Yeah, and I would never, don't worry, really set you up. <clears throat> okay. Here, they're just rolling out those conditions, which we've spent a lot of time on already, so I'm going to skip through it. But it does highlight that even for one sample, right, we're checking for a confidence interval. We're checking the observed number of successes, whereas for a hypothesis test, we're checking the expected numbers of, of successes under the null hypothesis, right? And so that's another way that you can remember which condition to check. The pooled proportion is old news at this point, but when we're comparing two proportions, okay, we're not given a null value. There's no value that I can compare this to. And so we use the pooled proportion. So this is just kind of outlining further why we use the pooled proportion. And it's the number of successes in group one plus the number of successes in group two over the total, which is N1 plus N2. So let's calculate the pooled proportion of Duke students and Americans who would be bothered a great deal by the melting of the Northern ice cap. So the number of successes at Duke was 69 and the number of successes in all US was 454. So we have 69 plus 454. We just push everyone in the pool. And if you're a success, you're a success. And if you're not, you're not. And so overall, 105 plus 680 gets us to 523 over 785. Now notice that this is 0.666. And there's a follow-up here, which sample proportion is the pooled estimate closer to? So if we compare 0 0.666 to 0.657 and 0.668, huh, this is closer to the bigger part of my sample, 
right? And so it's pooled in a way where, okay, it's it's going to be overrepresented by the larger part of the of the sample, and and that's the point. Okay, and so here, this is closer to p hat u s since n u s is greater than n duke. It takes up more of the total successes and and more of the total in general. All right, so it's just kind of leaning that way, but that's okay. If you think of it the, on the flip side, if you let the Duke students rule the roost, then that's also not good, right? That's not good, but in the opposite direction. So we've got our null hypothesis. And if we were to check our success failure condition, because the if we've done a confidence interval already, right, we argued that each sample was randomly sampled. So there's independence within each group. We argued that there's independence between the two groups, right? No reason to think that they're not independent. And now for the success failure condition, let's go ahead and do it. I want N1 times P hat, that's it. Just always hearing tiny knocks. I'm like my dog, who was at the door? Always freaking out, even when there's no one there. 105 times 0.666, who cares, but it's going to be greater than 10, I can tell you that much. But let's just do it 105 times uh, nothing nice. I tried it with, with the, the exact value, which you could do, uh, but it didn't give me a nice number, so I'll just use the rounded value. I get 69.5. Oops, nine three, not six three, which is greater than or equal to 10. So that's good. N1 times Q hat. I could do the calculation, right? One minus 0. 0.666 times 105. What's another thing I could do? I could take 105 minus 69.93, right? If I'm expecting 69.93 failures or successes, I'm expecting 105 minus that failures. Said the wrong word earlier. 35. So 105 minus 69.93 is 35.07, which is still greater than or equal to 10. So that's good. How about group two? N2 times P hat is 680 times 0.666. I get 452.88, which is definitely greater than or equal to 10. And then I'll use the same sort of shortcut, not really. N times Q hat is 680 minus, what, minus, not divided by the previous, which is 227.12, which is also greater than or equal to 10. I didn't show any work. I'm not going to. I should. Okay. I'll just bump this down. How did I get there? I did 680 minus 452.88, 227. Nice. Now the conditions for inference are satisfied. Now we can do our hypothesis test. We've already established our null and alternative hypotheses in that multiple choice question and you had two options, equally fine. So now we wanna, step two, 
Step one was do find the null and alternative hypotheses. Step two is do the test. Z from your formula sheet, right, is P1 hat minus P2 hat technically minus zero, right, from a difference of zero. How far is the difference that you saw from a difference of zero? Taking into account the standard error, which now uses the pooled proportion, which is why you needed it. And so, and she uses the distributed version, but I like to condense it, it doesn't matter. Either way, you're gonna find a, a Z of negative 0.22. In terms of step three, find the p-value. A Z of, and fine, I'll add a page here. If you find that Z is negative 0.22, does that look like on your normal distribution, Z is centered on zero. You had a, a difference in proportions that was only 0.22 standard errors below zero. That's really very close to zero, right? And so here we found that Z is negative 0.22. Remember the definition of the p-value is the probability, which makes it a, an area under the curve, the probability of seeing something as extreme or more extreme, which will always put you in the tail, depending on which side that'll dictate the tail, right? And so here your p-value, your one-sided p-value, is going to be that area. So we can use the Z table to find that area, or you can use Excel, obviously. Uh, but on the test, we're only going to have the tables. So let's go back there. I have a negative, negative 0.2. And you don't want to do something silly like negative 2, right? Usually that's where we're at. So that's I don't blame you, but you want to make sure that you grab the right Z. So negative 0.22. The table gives you the area to the left always, right? And so the one-sided p-value is 0.4129. So using the Z table, The probability that Z is less than or equal to negative 0.22 is 0.4129, I think. I don't want to go back there. Okay, fine. I better not have something weird. Yeah, 0.4129. This is your one-sided p-value, right? And so here, this is the one-sided p-value. We have to go way back to the alternative hypothesis to determine if we need the two-sided p-value. If we do, it's just a matter of multiplying by two, right? And pretending that I would be equally concerned with this happening just as far on the upper end, right? That's the idea of a two-sided test. So this would be the p-value if my alternative hypothesis was P Duke minus P U S is less than zero, right? But I want to know if it's different from zero. So not just this side, but also I'm going to allow it to happen in the upper end. Okay. And so we want, we want this area as well, right? So the two-sided p-value 
is the probability that z is less than or equal to negative 0.22 times 2, which is 2 times 0 0.4129, which is, who knows, 2 times 0 0.4129, very large, at 0 0.8258. What does that mean for our conclusion? Well, in order to have enough evidence to reject H naught, our p-value has to be small enough. In this case, our p-value is huge. So we do not have enough evidence to reject H naught. And we use the same sentence structure as before. So step four is our conclusion. Since and this is where you outline everything that you know, right? Tell me everything that you know. Don't leave anything to chance. Since the one-sided p-value, or one-sided, whoa, 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 two-sided p-value, show off that you knew how to find, that you knew to find a two-sided p-value, right? There's no harm in saying that or show me that you wanted a one-sided p-value. Since the two-sided p-value of 0.8258, don't cut corners here, right? It's tempting to say, since the p-value is less than 0.05, right? Or not less than 0.05, but you've already done all the work. Why not just say it, right? Since the two-sided p-value of 0.8258 is not less, is not less than, whenever the alpha level is not given, we assume 0.05. And if I'm assuming 0.05, I'm gonna say our assumed alpha level of 0.05. Our assumed alpha level of 0 0.05. We do not have enough evidence to reject H naught. Okay. Notice here is not less than, and we do not have enough evidence to reject H naught. That structure is the same as before, right? Here, what are you doing? You're comparing your P value to your alpha level. Compare the p-value to the alpha level, right? Is it less than or not less than 0.05 or whatever the alpha level is that you've been given? The next thing is your conclusion in terms of the null hypothesis, right? Do you have enough evidence to reject H0? or do you not have enough evidence to reject H naught? Those are your only options. I don't wanna hear about HA, right? We fail to reject HA or anything weird like that. It's only in terms of the null hypothesis. Why? Because we did all our testing assuming the null hypothesis was true, right? And so here, this is your conclusion in terms of H naught. If you're rejecting H naught, then you're allowed to say in favor of HA, right? But you don't have to if you want to play it safe, right? What does that mean? This is arguably the most important part of the conclusion. Conclusion is three marks for a reason, right? Let that be your guide. One mark, two marks, three marks because you have to say what it means for the question, right? And so this is where you reword the question as an answer. Do these data suggest that the proportion of all Duke students who would be bothered a great deal by the melting of the northern ice cap differs from the proportion of Americans who do? These data suggest that the proportion of all Duke students who would be bothered a great deal by the melting of the northern ice cap differs from the proportion of Americans who do, period. Right, you just reword it as a, 
does not. Oh my gosh. Uh, words. Let me copy this. These data do not, oh, I made it one word, do not suggest that the proportion there, how's that? Do not suggest that the proportion of all Duke students who would be bothered a great deal by the melting of the Northern ice cap differs from the proportion of Americans who do, period. And that's the most important part is your conclusion in terms of the question. That matches what we found in our confidence interval, right? Our confidence interval included zero, 95% confidence interval is equivalent to a two-sided hypothesis test at an alpha level of 0.05, why? You're either into the tails and the tail area is less than 0.05 or you're within the central 95. And so that's, they go hand in hand. Nice. And then we already talked about this, so that's all good. And next week we'll introduce chi-squared goodness of fit tests. If you have any questions, let me know. Otherwise, have a great weekend. See you Monday. Oh, I don't see you Monday. No labs next week. Wow, you're on easy street, huh? Or that's what you think. <laughs>